our topic this week, the theme, we've been choosing a theme for each week, and our theme this week was what happened to sin. You know, it's just not very fashionable anymore. We don't even like to talk about it. We're, we're, we're very quick to attribute responsibility to all sorts of things, but, but sin just doesn't make it into the conversation, unfortunately, even very often in church world. And I don't think God's changed his mind. Sin's is still a real deal. So for this particular session, we're going to talk about being washed clean. How can we be clean from the stain of sin? Because it's possible. Sin does not have the power to determine your future unless you give it that power. God has intervened on our behalf so that we can be freed from the pull and the attraction of sin and the consequence of sin. But there's some things that we have to do. So that's our target in this session. We're going to move pretty quickly. I hope you'll listen fast. Can you do that? Turn to the person on your right and say, I'm a good listener. Now look at the person on your left and say, I don't think you are, but I'll help you. Okay, being washed clean. A couple of observations to start with. And to be honest, they're really revelations from Scripture. Without Scripture, you wouldn't know this. If you've never read your Bible, if you don't believe the Bible, if you don't attach authority to the Bible, this will not be apparent to you. But, but the two statements that have to do with sin. One, sin is terminal. Unless there's an intervention on your behalf, sin in your life is terminal. It will lead you to destruction. Every time, nobody escapes. There's a 100% mortality rate, fatality rate. The second thing you need to know about sin is that it's highly contagious. It is highly contagious. Now, you know this intuitively, if you'll think just a minute. If you just watch somebody else misbehave, how often do you feel the freedom to do so? And before you shake your head no, I want you to think with me about driving down I-24. And some bozo misbehaves. And you feel pretty justified in responding to them in less than godly fashion because after all, they started it with their misbehavior. It's not my fault. It was the way they were driving that made me act that way. I can make it a lot more personal. Imagine we had one of the sanctuaries filled with teenagers. If I rolled in there with an unlimited supply of beer and pornography, how many of you think it'd be hard to get a problem started? Sin's contagious. It doesn't require much coaching. Doesn't require much mentoring. If you have credit cards and unlimited access to shopping, you need some significant self-discipline to keep from getting in trouble. If you just have an ungodly or wicked inclination and somebody else, particularly somebody with some authority, says, go ahead, we've all been there. We're bolder in groups. We're more brazen if we have authority. Sin is highly contagious. Two facts. It's fatal. It's terminal if it's left unaddressed. And it's highly contagious. Now, we're living in a season of, of pandemic but I'm going to suggest to you there's more than one. COVID-19, we've heard lots and lots and lots about that, a global pandemic. We get reports from the nations of the world, infection rates, death rates, hospital utilization rates. I mean, just about every media source you can imagine has given you an update on the COVID-19 pandemic. But I would submit to you there's an equal pandemic just parallel with it. It's a rebellion against God. The, the, the short word for that is sin. Sin is being displayed in our world at an unprecedented rate. And it's affecting the, the churched world as dramatically as it's, as, it's, as it's affecting the unchurched world. There's more apostasy. There's more turning away from Scripture. There's more organized religious groups, Christian groups, saying that the Bible isn't the Word of God, that Jesus was not the incarnate Son of God, that the biblical boundaries around human sexuality and life practice aren't something to be considered any longer. We can set those aside. The technical word for that's apostasy, but the underlying description of it is rebellion against God. It's sin. It's a pandemic. Now, we've heard a lot about COVID lately. You won't need me to. It's introduced us all to some new practices. And almost all of them come from expressions in our hearts. We have a desire to survive. And a few weeks ago, when we first began to hear about it, we believed it was deadly. So we were very astute listeners. 
And we didn't have good science yet. There wasn't enough data. We just had a lot of theory that was masquerading as science. So most of the responses were fear-based because the information was so limited. Nevertheless, we responded. Now, thankfully, the overwhelming majority of us have not had life-transforming personal experiences of tragedy with COVID. But there's some things now that are a part of our daily conversation that three months ago we hardly ever thought about. Words like social distancing. You know, they tell us from a medical standpoint, it's, it was best to stay home. And if you have to go out, keep your distance. How many of you practice social distancing at least once in the last six, 90 days, huh? We're practicing it tonight. It's why we're out here in God's sanctuary. Then we learned about quarantining, but this was new. We're going to quarantine healthy people and shelter in place in the broadest possible ways. Churches, corporations, restaurants, small businesses, athletic events, golf tournaments. God forbid you should be outside. Don't go to the beach. We're quarantining. We're sheltering in place. If you're healthy, stay there. And then we've learned about masks. We're still learning. You understand, I assume, that masks are to protect others from you. When you wear a mask, you're protecting everybody else. They don't protect you from other people. And we're all waiting on the salvation's promised of a vaccine so that we no longer have to be afraid of COVID. In fact, they say there's no true relief from the fear until we have a vaccine. Well, I'd like to borrow those same criteria if you'll allow me just a moment and give them some application with regard to the, the other part of this pandemic. Our rebellion against God, sin. We've, it's been given very little attention. There's hardly any media coverage. There's very little messaging. In fact, sin, I, I believe, is a rather inconvenient truth. We don't even like to talk about it anymore. Our response to sin has been much less intense than our response to COVID-19. Almost every one of us have had some pretty dramatic transformations in how we behave and interact and what our daily routines are with regard to a virus. But when we talk about sin, we are very, 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 very reluctant to respond. And I think, honestly, the reason is we simply refuse to believe it to be deadly. We think we can beat it. We don't imagine that sin really has a consequence. And yet, in spite of that, it's bad science because every one of us has significant personal experience with the destructive nature of sin. Everybody here that's above the age of about 12 has been closely associated with someone who engaged in a pattern of behavior that was rebellious towards God, and you've seen the fruit of destruction that it brought. Does that sound right? How many of you have seen the destructive expression of sin in the life of somebody? We all have. But we tend to set it aside. Well, I want to use the lessons we've been learning from COVID and see if we can find some application. Social distancing. Don't purposely be with people who increase your risk of ungodliness. Just don't do that. Shelter in place. Don't intentionally be present where sin is being practiced. Don't do that. The mask lives in such a way that you don't cause other people to sin. There is no vaccine to sin. And I think in the Christian church, we've tried to live that way. Salvation, conversion is not a vaccine for sin. The new birth doesn't deliver you from the consequences of practicing sin. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 says, Just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men. Because we've all sinned. We've all got the problem. Every one of us. Nobody is immune. In Galatians 3, it says, The scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner to sin. So I want to take this sin problem and just put it in three buckets really quickly. Sin's been addressed by God. In Ephesians 1, 7, it says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Through the blood of Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is made available to every human being. It's not based on our height or our IQ or our social status or the schools we attended or the accent with which we speak. 
In Colossians 1, it says he's rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He has rescued us. God launched a, a search mission to rescue us from the consequence of sin. It's available to every human being. We can't wish it away. We can't ignore it and deliver ourselves. In 1 Corinthians 6, we're reminded, it says, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Paul's writing that to a church. It didn't matter if you were Jewish and you were a part of the covenant people or you were a part of a congregation of believers. You can't practice wickedness and inherit the kingdom of God. It's impossible. And then he goes on to list more than a dozen characteristics. It's not an inclusive list by any means. Sexual immorality, idolatry, adultery, prostitution, homosexuality, thieves, greedy, drunkards, slanderers, swindlers. He said they will not inherit the kingdom of God. But then he gives us the good news. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You were washed, you were made clean, you were justified to be just as if you never sinned. You were sanctified, you were set apart for the purposes of God. You weren't created to serve sin. And God intervened to deliver us. We desperately need to hear the message in the church, not beyond the church. We've imagined that something else is going to deliver us, a better economy or the right politician or the correct ideology or a better set of, of, of something, but it, it's within us the problem. And the only delivery comes as an individual yields to the Lordship of Jesus of Nazareth. Our sin is forgiven. We are redeemed. We're sanctified and justified. Secondly, we're told the power of sin is broken over our lives. Its power is broken. We're not removed from the arena of sin. We still wrestle with temptation. It presents in all kinds of ways lust. That's not simply sexual. We can lust after food and want more than's good for us. We call that gluttony. We can lust after power. We can look what other people have and we can be consumed with the desire for it and, and feel that somehow it's inappropriate that we don't have it. That's envy and covetousness. It is rampant all around us and within us. Greed, pride. We alter our consciousness so that our minds aren't clear and our emotions aren't clear. We'll use alcohol or drugs, legal or illegal. The biblical word for that is sorcery. We numb ourselves. We have a sin problem. We've simply looked away. But the power of sin is broken over our lives if we will choose to cooperate. In Romans 6 and verse 11, it says, Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. We're given an assignment. If you're dead to something, it has no attraction to you. I like chocolate. I'm not particular. People say, you like light chocolate, dark chocolate. Yes. You like chocolate cake, chocolate pie. Uh-huh. Chocolate candy, uh-huh. I like chocolate spray. I just like chocolate. But I'm pretty sure when my body's done and my earth suit quits working, you could bury me in M&Ms and I wouldn't be tempted. No attraction to me, no reaction from me. I'm good. And the, the instruction we're given is to consider ourselves dead to sin. Don't make an allowance for it. Same chapter, verse 13 says, don't offer the parts of your body to sin. Don't do that as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God. You see, we have a role to play, and rather than engage in this struggle, we've just pretended to change the conversation. We've looked for a broader definition so that, although we used to think that was sin, but now we've got a Supreme Court ruling, and it says it's okay, it's the law of the land. Folks, not every law of the land is just. Romans 6.22 says, now you've been set free from sin 
and have become slaves to God. It's a very intentional contrast. Prior to the redemptive work of Jesus, we were enslaved to sin. But now we've been set free. We have been set free so that we can be enslaved to God. And it says the result of that is eternal life, but that the wages of sin, if you choose to practice sin, we all face temptations, we all struggle, we all yield from time to time, and we have commit sin. There's a difference in struggling with sin and practicing sin. Day after day, week after week, maintaining the facade of your faith, but being a practitioner of sin, it says the wages of sin is death. In Romans 8 and verse 13, it says, if you live according to your sinful nature, you will die. But if we live by the Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. It's a contrast. We have a choice to make. Will we believe what God has said and will, will, will we order our lives appropriately or will we choose our own path? We can't hide in church. This isn't a message for the pagans or the ungodly or the immoral or somebody that you don't like or that you wish would change. This is a message that we have to make personal. Amen. One last piece of this, the struggle of sin. The struggle of sin. It's a struggle, and we've got to be candid enough to acknowledge that. If we pretend we live above it, we're not honest. Doesn't matter how many years you've been a Christian or how many sermons you've endured or how often you've served or how generously you have given. The Bible describes sin as something that crouches at our door. It's predatory. Peter said that we have an adversary that roams about like a roaring lion. It's evil. It doesn't play fair. It'll take place of emotional vulnerability, of points of weakness, of, of times of great stress. It's wicked. It's evil. Romans chapter 7 and verse 25 says, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law but in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. That's the Apostle Paul writing. And he said, in my mind, I've made a commitment to honor God. But in my old earthly nature, and we've all got one of those, even the born again ones of us, he said, I still battle with sin. In Galatians 5, 24, it says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. You've got to do something about that old, earthly, Adamic, carnal nature. You can't just hide it. You can't dress it up. In Galatians 6, 8, it says, The one who sows to please his sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. And the one who sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Every day, with your words, with your actions, with your thoughts, with, with all that you are as a person, you're sowing into one harvest or another. It's what brings all those boundaries that you've been practicing around COVID-19 into play with your spiritual life, social distancing. What it means to be quarantined from ungodly things. In 2 Timothy 3, perhaps the one that seems most relevant for this season, it says, mark this, there'll be terrible times in the last days. And then he lists more than a dozen attributes of the human character that will deteriorate. And three of them are built around love. It's commonplace today to hear everybody say, you know, that God's a God of love. That the commandment of the New Testament is to love one another. And how could a God of love ever discipline or bring judgment? It's true he's a God of love, but you're ignoring that he's also a God of justice and truth. Listen to the list. People will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money. Boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And then Paul drops the hammer. He gives us the punchline. He says they have a form of godliness, but they deny its power. Have nothing to do with them, he said. Quarantine from them. He's describing religious people. 
He's writing it to a young man who he's mentoring in the faith. And it's a description as we come to the conclusion of this age of the behavior that will be paramount amongst those of us that stand under the umbrella of religion. He said they'll be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. They won't love godliness. They'll be lovers of themselves and lovers of money have nothing to do with them. There's only one solution to our sinful nature and it's execution. Not to physically harm yourself, but to take that old earthly carnal nature and don't feed it, don't provide it sustenance, address it. Social distance from carnal Christians. Well, they say they're a Christian. I understand, but their, their life doesn't bear the fruit of it. Develop other relationships to use with your discretionary time. Bring people close to you that will encourage you in godliness and holiness and purity. We've drifted so far away from those concepts, they seem foreign to us now. They seem so distant. There is no solution to the problems that face us as people if we fail to address our sin problem. There is no solution. There's no economic solution, political solution, ideological solution. We, are, we share a universal problem. It transcends nations and government systems. Thank God he has made provision for us to be free. Join us every week for another exciting message from Pastor Alan Jackson. And until then, visit us online and discover remarkable information and resources to help take your Christian life to the next level. And when you visit online, consider joining our effort to continue sending this powerful and challenging message around the globe. We want to share this program worldwide, but we can only do it with your help. So consider partnering with us today. And if you're visiting the Nashville area, we'd love to see you at World Outreach Church in Murfreesboro. We're easy to find, so look us up when you're traveling through. And don't forget to connect with Pastor Jackson every day through social media. Thanks so much for joining us and being a part of this ministry. We'll see you again next time for another encounter with Pastor Alan Jackson. Hey, this is Pastor Allen. Thanks so much for giving me just a moment of your time. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, I want to encourage you to do a couple of things. Give it a like, share it with your friends. Most importantly, subscribe. That way, when there's new content or a live stream, you'll be notified. I pray God blesses you in your spiritual journey. I'll see you soon.